thought it was the foreign mistresses. <laughs> that too. <laughs> Just as a, a point of information, the Danish astronomer, Ole Römer, uh, built four similar planet machines, uh, golden, which you can see copies of in Rosenborg and at the Ole Römer Museum. And one he sent to the to the uh, to the Shah of Persia, and uh, and then he, he sent two others. I don't remember where. And then the the last one he sent to that uh, that to Edward. Kangxi. What year would that have been? Uh, I, I don't know, mm -hmm. but okay. but uh, it's documented that it, he sent it to him. Yeah. Yeah. As yeah, a gift from the Danish king. Right. Uh, when did Confucius actually live? So he's older than, than Buddha, obviously. He's before yes. Buddha. Yes. Yes. When was Buddha? When was Buddha? I think it was about uh, the same time. About, about four. Twenty-five hundred. Twenty-five hundred. That's more like the back. time of. Uh, oh. From now. From now. About five hundred. Yeah, it's about the same time. He was about 400 BC. Okay. Oh, I forget I the years. Was Mencius it. was about 250 BC, about 150 okay. years after Confucius. Plato was about the same time. About the same time. Wow. Approximately. Spark, genius yeah. Hit the planet. Yeah. 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 You have any speculations on that? On, on why? Well, I think. No, no, that the fact that you have in these different cultures at the same yeah. time, yeah, that's, that's seemingly an explosion of profound ideas about uh, man and nature. Man and nature. Yeah, 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 I think so. I think it's, I mean, you could, you could say that we suspect there was much more interface between these cultures than we know of. That's possible, and that there was an interface and these ideas were being bounced back and forth. Or you could say it's the same thing as this idea that we've discussed, the Vernatskian idea, that when the universe reaches a certain point where life becomes possible, life evolves, possibly at different places at the same time. And that when it reaches a point of energy flux density that creativity can take root in a human being, in an animal, and change it into a higher species, that can happen also simultaneously at different places. And civilization's development universally is universal and are they in touch and contact that's a, it's an interesting issue but it's also very possible that you simply have the development of civilization in such a way that uh, you end up having similar problems confronting civilization in every part of the world and the human mind will tend to go in that direction which was Kuz's I mean um, yeah Kuz's and Leibniz's idea was that the human mind tends towards a concept of the truth and that this idea of God in the Christian religion uh, if you look at it as constituting not a dogma of the church but an expression of the truth of the universe all minds must tend towards that because those minds in fact are created in the image of God and will tend to think in that way. The argument that the Jesuits and Kang Shi tried to convey to the popes who were passing these bulls against Confucianism. One of the arguments was that it's uh, it's a, uh, it's a sacrilege or a, a heresy to say that these pagan Chinese believed in the one God. How could they? They hadn't been. Uh, they they Probably didn't. Educated. They didn't know Christ, right? <laughs> They didn't have revelation. If, they, if, you're not, if you don't know the revelation of Christ, you can't possibly have known the one God. But they just said, now wait a minute, you yourselves argue that this is the true nature of man and that the mind necessarily will converge towards that concept of God. Well, then how can you turn around and say they could not have known God? And of course, Leibniz had a much more practical argument, which was this civilization was more advanced than yours, buddy. <laughs> and that proves that they knew something, yeah. you know. Yeah. There was a question from the phone. Uh, you mentioned in the beginning. Oh, good. Um, that um, 
there was some kind of revival of Confucianism now going on in China. <clears throat> I was waiting for the smoker to return since she answered. Oh, is, well, she, is she going to come back or is she still smoking? Yeah, she'll come. I'll join her. We'll come in together. Oh, she's coming now. Okay, okay. So you have to wait. Oh, okay. <clears throat> What, what's, what's her name? I didn't Carol. meet her. She's American. Oh, is she Carol? Yeah. Oh, that's why. Do you have to leave? Okay. Carol, this one's also for you. Yeah. Is on, on coming, on coming back into? No, not right. Okay. So fast. Anyway, your question, your question about about Confucianism in in uh, Maoist China. Now this is very important because <clears throat> you you all, you've all heard about the Cultural Revolution and what a disaster the Cultural Revolution was. Um, I I've written at some length also uh, on political intelligence issues to show that the Cultural Revolution was actually forced onto China. It started in 66, but you remember what was going on in the early 1960s. This is when they killed Kennedy, they dragged the United States into this hideous Vietnam War, the war in Indochina, which of course was right on China's border. Uh, as soon as Kennedy was dead, they launched a, a genocide in Indonesia against the largest communist party outside of China which was not some ideological Chinese, Chinese, I mean, communist party, but it was actually the base of the hero of Indonesia, Sukarno. And they just unleashed a, a radical jihadist Islamic mentality in Indonesia that led to the slaughter of some say 10 or 15,000 people, some people say 100,000 people um, across Indonesia. Uh, uh, and generally sabotaged any effort to have some sort of um, some sort of uh, um, non-aligned movement based on bridging the Cold War gap between the East and the West. So the Chinese were sort of boxed in, unleashed this hideous cultural revolution. And part of that process, one of the worst actually, was that the person in China who most in the Chinese leadership who most represented a, a sane policy, a policy of development and science and technology and collaboration with the West, and who was one of Mao's right hand men, Zhou, Zhou Enlai. You might remember Zhou Enlai. Uh, he was identified by the radical Maoists, the Red Guards, as being a Confucian who was trying to impose. Uh, this kind of structure on our society when we reject all authority, we reject all Western influence. This was the, you know, the radical Red Guard mentality. Um, so they launched an anti-Confucius campaign, which politically was actually an anti Zhou and Lai campaign, but correctly identified that as being against reason, against any kind of organized uh, state and reason. And Mao was sort of a mixed figure. Um, he actually intervened to protect Zhou Enlai. So he ended up not getting killed, which could have happened. But um, in any case, th that played itself out. After the Cultural Revolution, there was no longer this vi sort of uh, intense anti-Confucianism. But it still remained sort of equated with religion, which was the opiate of the masses and something to be prevented, you know. But with the fall of the of the Maoists and the emergence of China, um, it took a while. But there's now a very, very significant uh, revival of Confucianism in China, and I'll just very briefly say that it's it's experiencing the same problem that emerged right after the period I was talking about, which, which was that after Zhu Xi, who you could think of as sort of the um, uh, the Kuza or the Leibniz of China, there was another thinker whose name was Wang Yangming, who was like the Voltaire of China, or the Aristotle of China, who is called a Neo-Confucian. If you hear the term Neo-Confucianism, it refers both to Zhu Xi's school and to this later 1500s Wang Yang Ming school, but which is purely pragmatism, 
sense certainty uh, and trying to claim modernity, but really just a return to sort of the British ideological thinking of um, man as, a, as, an, as an animal, the mind as a blank slate, um, rejecting Zhu Xi's teachings precisely because they say it's mystical. When it's not mystical, it's spiritual. It's not mystical, it's spiritual, because, you know, ideas are spirits. They're not, I mean, how, how much is an idea way, you know? It's spirits, it's, it's a spiritual thing. And yet it's a thing, it's a thought object, it's real, an idea is real. It's very concrete, not in substance, but it's, it's real. It's just that it's a spiritual reality, or a thought object, as LaRouche likes to call it. Uh, or as an idea as Plato called it. So, um, th there's, in, in the current revival of Confucianism, there's this re ongoing battle which has to be fought out in the same way that we have to fight out this idea of forming a renaissance here. And, you know, without that renaissance, we're not likely to stop this economic and strategic disaster that's unfolding. Um. At one point, they stopped, they stopped sailing, and didn't they enter a dark age? Yeah, you're right. When was that? That was 14... Um, what, what happened? You know, I told you about these treasure ships that were sailing all over the, the Admiral Cheng He, this Muslim, actually, a Muslim, um, Castrati. General, who uh, Cus Muslim <laughs> quite the a combination. He was the head, the head admiral for the Chinese. He led the great treasure ships. He's an incredible guy. Why do you know that? Oh, it's well known. It's well known. Okay. Um, but uh, you know, there were a lot of eunuchs in China. This was a big thing. They did it all right. the time. It's just one of the crazy oh, things. But yeah, yeah, they took care of the harem. But it spread. It, I mean, it was there were other reasons too. I mean, they did it here too. Remember how they made boys into sopranos by, <laughs> you know. But um, the uh, um, it it's it's something I always wanted to really delve into was why in the world this happened. But in about about the same time that the Renaissance was starting in Europe. It stopped in China. It stopped in China. Yeah. And you had this, it was the Confucians of the day, but when, when, they, when they used the term Confucians at that time, as, as much as I've been able to determine, it was people who'd become very much the, the, um, the bureaucracy of the government. And the arguments used were just like the greenie arguments of today. We shouldn't be wasting money on going to the moon when we have all our problems at home. We should be taking care of our own and not worrying about these expensive trips all over the place. We have to take care of ourselves. And it, it, it happened. It worked. It was not, I mean, it's a Taoist conception, but it was the Confucian scholars, degenerate Confucian scholars of the day, just as Christian leaders, you know, as Dante likes to point out, you know, became some of the most corrupt uh, leaders in, in the West, leading crusades and such things. So that's what happened there about the same time. And it's, it's really sad because the Ming Dynasty basically collapsed at that time. Um, it was revived. I mean, that's one of the reasons the Manchurians were able to come in and pretty much take over. It's because the, the, the Ming had given up uh, and, in fact, this guy Wang Yangming, I told about, came in after that, when there was a general period of decay in China, and Wang Yangming jumped in to become the, the ideologue of this perverted form of, of Confucianism. And the economy decayed. And it wasn't, uh, it wasn't until the Jesuits came in and the Manchurians had taken over no, actually, no, 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 I'm sorry. The Manchurians didn't take over till later. The Jesuits came in in the 1500s. The, the, um, the, the Ming Dynasty was still there, but it was going through this decay. And there was a slow process of assimilation of these new, these new Western ideas coming into China with a lot of resistance. And it wasn't really until the Manchurians came in, and especially 
the second emperor, the son of the first emperor, this guy Kangxi, that just things took off. That's when it really began to revive. But it's true, China had gone through a, about a century and a half of a degeneration. Yeah. And uh, I was thinking of trying to discuss this question of Wang Yangming because, you know, it's a fascinating issue. It's a very clear case of a Platonic thinker, Zhu Xi, and an Aristotelian thinker, Wang Yangming which gives you again a reading of how parallel the developments in China to the parallel developments that we have here. You know, the same fights are going on. The fight between the idea that man is, is born in the image of God with the creative power in his mind, uh, capable of mastering laws of the universe, all of that in, in, on the one hand, and then this Aristotelian oligarchical idea of man as an animal who has to either use his power and strength to master over the world or as a slave, uh, and finding various kinds of ideologies to keep people passive and backwards, as you have in the West and you have in the East. So, I'm, you're right, that, that was, and I, I'm not satisfied that I know how that happened, how things fell apart like that. How about the Black Death? Yeah, that was the Mongols. The Mongols brought that into they Europe. They did, okay. Yeah. And then it came to Europe. Or yeah, they brought it. Been there already. No, they brought it to Europe. That was the Mongols. You know, Europe, I talked about this at my speech in Frankfurt, if you get a chance to read that. Because that was, um, that was one of the times where there was tremendous potential for East-West collaboration. But the Mongols, who had full support from Venice, the Venetian crowd, when, when the Mongols swept through China and depopulated China by about a third, almost as bad as they did in, in Europe when they came here, uh, destroyed the Song Renaissance, and then swept east through the Islamic world, destroyed the opposite caliphate, and raped Baghdad. The Venetians were helping them sell the gold that they'd stole from China, and from Baghdad, selling them slaves. You know, this is this is the empire. You know, the dope traders business and the slave as usual. business as usual, <laughs> exactly. And then, uh, and then, the, the Mongols politely avoided Venice and swept up into Eastern Europe and brought with it the plague. So even when they left, they left the plague, and for another hundred years, Europe was just you know decimated, yeah. collapsed. But, but partially because they had left themselves weak through this process of the Crusades and everything. You know, they undermined their own strength against it. Yeah? Uh, I was just wondering, could you just compare two similar situations in, uh, like, having a nation happening in Europe, with uh, at one point having a society where um, the people are suppressed, and then on the other hand, development. So it's like the same, like... Same uh, dynamic. Yeah, but, but how come do you have this... Well, I think, I think because we're human beings. And, you know, there's a commonality of the human mind. There's always the tendency to allow tyrants to have their way. If, if, we're, if, we're, if we allow our luminous virtue to be obscured, then tyrants will take advantage of it. Okay. But what they had over there is not similar to the British Empire. Well, they no, actually it's not. It's true. They never really had that kind of an empire. They never, even then, didn't never aspired to go out conquering the way the empire did. They did reach out this period of the great ships, they were reaching out, but it was incredibly peaceful. They had to do some fighting because they occasionally ran into some pirates and things. So there was, there was, I think, seven big journeys with huge fleets of these huge ships who went down through Indonesia and the Malacca Straits. They went into the Indian Ocean. They went to Ceylon. They went to Persia. But not There's lots to, of books not in about order to conquer. No, never to conquer. They never conquered That's anyone. Like like they like took dip, diplomat, diplomatic representatives from these countries back to China with them. <laughs> you know, to I mean, there was a lot of exchange going on, and they went up and down the coast of Africa. They were in Zanzibar, um, and up into the Gulf 
of the, the Persian Gulf. to Europe. No, they never got around to Europe. I'm sure they would have, and I'm sure they would have gotten to America. But what you described happened. Something happened where they actually destroyed the ships in order yeah, to prevent. So yeah, yeah, it was insane. And I'm not, I've never been satisfied that I understand that or, or that anybody I've read can really explain it. They say what happened. But they say the emperor did it. Well, I think the emperor probably was in on it, you know, whoever the emperor was at that time. But I've just never been satisfied that I understand something else happened in there that I don't get yet. And maybe if I have time sometime, I'll start up that project again, because I'd like to figure it out. It's important, you know, when you think about what turns a great nation into defeating itself. These are questions that do need to be answered. But, uh, the Shogun system, I guess it's a system as I understand, but when was that and what is the like the, the background ideas for, for how it was working? The Shogun system yeah, in yeah, Japan? Yeah, the Shogun, yeah. Oh, so that's, uh, didn't they have something Japanese. similar? Huh? No, didn't, didn't there was never a Shogunate, there was never a Shogunate in China. No, the Confucian concepts dominated even in the worst periods where Taoist and, and Buddhist influence was there. It never allowed for that kind of warlord shogunate policies that you had in Japan. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, again, in, in, in two minutes, um, my, my view of this is that the Buddhist culture that started in India uh, divided into two sections. One was known as the Mahayana, or the Greater Wheel, that was up in the north, and the other, the Theravada, that studied the original texts. It was the Mahayana that had all these sutras that you've heard about, the Lotus Sutra and stuff. So they kept adding new things. And every, all the Buddhists got pushed out of India when the Muslims came in. They basically recruited the Buddhists to Islam, and the Buddhists who didn't turn to Islam left. The Theravada Buddhists went down to Sri Lanka, they went to Cambodia, they went to, uh, to Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, that area. When did the Muslims come in? When was the big 12th century? 12th yeah, century? Who knows? 12th century. 11th and 12th century, maybe. I'm afraid I don't know exactly. But the Mahayana Buddhists left into China and Japan. The most extreme form of that was the Tantric Buddhists who went to Tibet. And this was a pure perverted sex cult, you know, who believed that the sex act was was the pinnacle of religious belief. And that's what the Dalai Lama and his crew is today, just real perverts uh, who just don't appreciate anything human. That's why he's so loved by the British. <clears throat> um, but uh, uh, the Mahayana Buddhism, which, which was not pure evil like the Tantric Buddhists, uh, did become dominant in China and in Japan, but especially in China, it never replaced the Confucian culture. During the Tang Dynasty, the Confucian culture was very much pushed into the background, but it never replaced it. And in that way, it never descended into the kind of really primitive culture that you had in Japan that came from the Shinto and its traditions, which were much more animist, much less Confucian. Confucianism was strong in Japan. I don't, I don't mean it wasn't, but I think it was completely, it was either subsumed into this three religion ideology, sort of a, you know, Shinto, and uh, what's the other one? Uh, anyway, the, the three cultures. China, too, had the so-called three religions, Taoism, uh, uh, Buddhism, and, and Confucian. And in fact, my writings uh, caused real controversy in China. When I first wrote stuff that got translated into Chinese and published there, the head of the Beijing Library, which is the you know center of culture in China, wrote a scathing attack against me for denouncing this British ideologue, Joseph Needham, who I won't go into the details of it, but he was one of the people who was basically promoting the idea that uh, Taoism was the real China, uh, and um, lots of lies and what he had to say, but especially pushing this idea that Chinese thinking is the three religions, Taoism, China, 
uh, Confucianism, Buddhism, that somehow it's combined. And you just don't understand anything if you don't understand that the Chinese mind is based on these three religions. And to attack the greatest lover of China from overseas, Joseph Needham, is just repulsive and you never should have published this idiot who knows nothing about me uh, and so forth. But, you know, that was good to see because this is the problem. Uh, it's the problem in China. It's far worse in Japan, historically. Uh, I think current, the last hundred years or so, or at least since the war, are a different story in Japan. But uh, in China, I think it's still something of a problem in that, uh, not that I understand their history better than they do, far from it. I mean, the Chinese are real historians. But there's just a tremendous influence of this kind of, um, what I think is, is uh, anti-reason cultural philosophy that is, uh, is pretty dominant. And there's also a lot of people who agree with me on that in China, you know, it's not like I'm alone or something. Did Japan and China have wars where they were like, I mean... Oh uh, yeah, yeah, well, the, the biggest ones of course were World War One and World War II. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there was things going back, there were various wars going back, but the Japanese generally were able to defend themselves. Mm. But, but I think I mean, what you said in terms of, of the Chinese tradition of when you went out to the world, it was not to conquer the world. At all, not at all. This is in, Never. in a Never very in stark contrast to the Japanese tradition, for instance, where you have these really, really terrible assaults on Korea and, you know, these on really, really terrible things that went on. And I'm saying it because now you then have a situation where in the world today this has come back in terms of of China going out to the world. Like this map that Hussein showed at the conference of projects China has is engaged in in Africa, which is an em enormous it's amount amazing. of projects. Yeah. Yeah. And this is all not based on the British notion of the idea of going in to conquer these countries and make them our slaves, so to speak. But this is, in a certain sense, in, in a much more straight sense, I say, think you could say business propositions. Raw you know, materials. We, no, no, well, that too. But, the, the, but empire, the empire wanted raw materials. The empire conquered uh, Karka. Africa in order to get their raw materials. Yeah. The difference in the Chinese is that the Chinese are paying for them. Yeah, right. <laughs> and they're paying for them by building infrastructure. They're saying, we need your raw materials. You need a modern economy. We'll build your railroads and we'll build your water projects. And that's why the British and the Americans hate them. That's why we went to one of the main reasons we destroyed Gaddafi in Libya was because the, they wanted to push China out of Asia, out of the Middle East. Same thing with Iraq. It sort of backfired in Iraq because the, the, this government that's in power in Iraq right now doesn't, doesn't think much of the United States and they are very happy to have the Chinese coming in and they're getting most of the oil contracts and building things. But, uh, you know, but that's absolutely right. You know, the Chinese have never conquered anybody. There have been wars in the periphery, you know. And they treat them as if they're an imperial power because they want to dominate Tibet. Well, you know, come on. This is like America wants to dominate Maine, you know. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's crazy it, it, stuff. But it also means you had, you had this, because like at the time of the fall of the Berlin Wall, in Britain there was this huge anti-German campaign where they said Germany was bad under Hitler, yeah. but it's a lot worse now because now they want to conquer the world with economic development. So it's the same kind yeah. of... Plus, the, the argument against China is that China is an emerging power. And always in history, when a nation pulls itself together and becomes a major power, like Bismarck in Germany, it naturally tends to become an imperial power who wants to reach out and we have to contain it. Because the British Empire has always been, don't allow any 
other nation or a group of nations to get the strength to challenge us. It's not stop them from challenging us. Don't allow them to get the strength and capacity to challenge us. This, the neocons in America when in the 1990s when Cheney and, uh, and, and Wolfowitz and this crowd were out of power during the Clinton years, but they were preparing this neocon machine. This was their argument. You know, we, the American empire, <clears throat> have to make sure that we don't allow any other nation, especially China or any alliance of nations, to get to a point where they will challenge our benevolent rule over the world. You know? uh, and so, the, and you still read this all the time today. Uh, General Dempsey, the head of our Joint Chiefs of Staff, very, very smart guy, who is the, probably the one thing standing between us and war with Iran right now, and probably war with Syria too, who totally opposes it and denounces this concept, even from his own commander-in-chief, Obama, this lunatic, uh, says that this, this would be a, a disaster for civilization. He also uh, says that this idea that we have to confront China, he calls it the, the um, uh, Thucydides trap. Thucydides was the historian, if I have this right, who described Sparta and uh, Athens, that uh, Sparta, which was the dominant military power in Greece at the time, when Athens grew and with, began to develop as a cultural and, and, and you know, political center, the Spartans launched war against Athens, not because they were a challenge, but because they might become a challenge. The idea that any power that is growing up in opposition to your strength has to be defeated before it reaches that point, which was what led to the Peloponnesian Wars and to the destruction of both. And Dempsey says, don't get caught in the Thucydides trap. Don't think that just because China is emerging, that therefore somehow it's inevitable that we have to have a conflict with them. It's not true. So, I mean, you know, he, I wish he'd say more often, we don't have to accept the British Empire line, you know, <laughs> and be honest, because he knows it. We know he knows it. We know from our contacts with people in the Joint Chiefs that they know full well how the British and Tony Blair and company are using Obama to launch these wars. But they're very aware that our relation with China is absolutely crucial for the future of civilization. Yeah. No, Vlad. Uh, I was just uh, in connection to what you said. Uh, is the real opposition between a growing China and the British Empire in the sense that uh, all this uh, expansion in recent years of China is uh, financed and uh, made possible by the uh, US economy and the empire? exactly working and uh, sending all the dollars and investments into China. I often, often uh, hear um, that uh, China's, China and China's economy is connected to USA's economy in a, in a very intertwined way. So if one collapses, the other collapses too. So China is growing, but it, it still it's, it will be very easy to just pull the chair under it, and the whole structure will collapse maybe 70 years back in time. The, the British keep saying so. They say Britain, the Chinese are going down, their bubble is bursting, it's going to go under, and so forth. As background, when Deng Xiaoping opened up after the Cultural Revolution, and when Nixon and Kissinger made their trip there, and so forth, and you began to see China opening up, um, actually, you, you probably all remember the Tien Tiananmen Square demonstrations in yeah. 1989. A little background to that will help get at what I was wanted to say, which was that <clears throat> one of the there there were two tendencies in China on how to open up. Uh, one was uh, Zhao, Zhao Ziyang. Zhao Ziyang was. Um, he was uh, the head of Shanghai. He was the heir apparent to Deng Xiaoping, who was the guy that opened up China. And Zhao Ziyang's role and his view was, I have met all the great minds of the West. Milton Friedman. Um, <laughs> no, really. No, um, uh, Alvin Toffler, Future Shock. Remember that? 
and uh, and especially um, uh, the clash of civilizations. Samuel Huntington. Samuel Huntington. And on and on. All of that. George Soros. He had met all these people. He had brought their texts into the universities in China <clears throat> and was teaching that the opposite of the communist totally controlled government that we have been under until now, if we're going to become modern, we have to reject that completely and adopt total free market, free trade, no regulation, no government control, no role in the government in directing credit into, into production, no control over banks, hedge funds. We have to become free. That, that's the shock therapy that happened in Russia, right? When they threw out, when the Soviet regime fell, and Yeltsin, who was a complete puppet of the British crowd, basically they called it shock therapy, just complete deregulation. And of course, Russia was destroyed in the 1990s, looted to the bone. They were literally ripping up factories and moving them out. I mean, it was destroyed. We, we published a book by <clears throat> a, a leading Russian scholar. We translated and published it called Genocide, which is about what happened in Russia in the 1990s under, under uh, the shock therapy of people like the, the, the Friedmanites. So <clears throat> that was one side. There was another faction in government under a guy named Hu Yaobang who said, uh, Zhao Ziyang was the guy who wanted to open up these free trade zones in the coast, which was like a completely unregulated. All of the foreign companies could come in, as you were describing, and set up their workshops, their sweatshops, I should say. Cheap production, using the labor for cheap labor for exports. So they were making some money Right, because they were people. They had to, the, gov the companies had to pay something in taxes and stuff. But by and large, their their workers were working for these companies that exported everything. There was nothing being done to change the basic infrastructure in China, and we warned them at that time that this was very dangerous. I wrote a, an article called "The Real Crimes of Zhao Ziyang," because at Tiananmen Square. Zhao Ziyang was accused of being behind the demonstrations. And in a sense he was, because he brought George Soros in, who funded a faction of the demonstrators, and who refused to go home at a time when it could have been resolved, and it ended up in the bloodbath, which was not quite as big a bloodbath as it was reported around the world, but was still pretty nasty. But that's because the Chinese could see a new cultural revolution in the making, and they just he said, we can't do it again. We can't go through 10 years of hell again, and crushed it. And that's a complex story. But there was an alternative, and that was this guy, Hu Yaobang, who said, we don't need these special economic zones. We need to open up. We need to invite investments. But the investments have to be in changing our economy, not just using our labor. We need to build our infrastructure. We need to create internal demand by building up the infrastructure of our nation. And that was a very fierce fight. And Zhao Jiang was pretty much on top, was getting his way. Then Hu Yabang died. And that's what led to the Tiananmen Square demonstrations, was people who came out. The people basically liked them both. They, there was, it was not real clear that they actually represented two very different policies. So it was the demonstrations for Hu Yabang's death that then led to the Soros people coming in and mobilizing this into a, a, a mass rally for Zhao Ziyang and for free trade, free market, and all of this kind of stuff. So most of the leaders of that were then brought back to Princeton and uh, to London and became these total free market, free trade ideologues, sort of the way the Russian uh, the Russian crew that had been brought into London and trained by Margaret Thatcher became the so-called oligarchs in Russia. So the Chinese saw what happened in Russia and they said, we're not going to let that happen here. We're not going to have shock therapy. So they protected against the worst of it. But they're still now in some trouble because they're still very dependent on these exports to Europe and the United States. And with Europe and the United States collapsing, they can't escape that. They're trying their best through big infrastructure. I mean, you look around the world, there's no big infrastructure going on anywhere except China. 
They have the biggest water project in the history of the human race, moving water from the south up to the north. There's never been such a massive infrastructural development policy. They built the Three Gorges Dam. Their high-speed rail, maglev rail. The maglev rail discovered in Germany, which the Greenies won't let the Germans build, is being used, you know, all over China. I saw the, I saw the documentary about the railway. Oh, yeah. I just actually recorded the statistics saying that uh, uh, right now 50% of the concrete production, I mean, c cement concrete mm -hmm. that's used for the building, is going to China. At they're using about 80% of the world's the world cement, yeah, yeah, it's true, because they're the only people building it. I read an article about, uh, <coughs> um, I think it's a journalist from Guardian, predicting the collapse uh, of Australia, because uh, for, the re for the past 15 years, ever since in China, China's economy was really beginning to speed up. Uh, a lot of investments went to Australia because uh, they, like 60 or 70 percent of all the um, export is going to China in terms of uh, different uh, raw materials. Coal, materials. coal especially, especially, and especially oil. And iron. And iron, yeah. But right now there's like 90 million unsold apartments in China. <laughs> and that's why he predicts that now they will stop until they sell those apartments. And that will bring the collapse of yeah. the Australian economy. Don't, don't believe the predictions. There is a problem, but the British want people to think China's about to collapse. Even the real estate bubble, which was a huge real estate bubble in China. Prices in, of real estate in China were far, far greater than in New York City. Uh, but there were no derivatives. The Chinese have not allowed the unregulated flow of derivatives. So the financial bubble in the United States, which blew and which started the big crisis, was not just that they were overbuilding, and it was not just that they were selling subprime mortgages to people who they knew couldn't pay. That was a problem. But the reason it caused the complete explosion of the entire world economy was because for every mortgage of $200,000, there were several billion dollars of mortgage-backed derivatives that were speculating on the value of real estate and the, and the, the, the level of interest rates, so-called mortgage default swaps. Have, you, you know about derivatives, you know how these things work. Bit, so you built up, mechanics, well, you built up trillions of dollars of pure gambling that were betting on where a market would be or where uh, an index would be. There was nothing underneath them. They weren't ownership of something. They were just gambling debts. And so that when, when you had a collapse of the housing bubble, that was serious enough, but <laughs> that was just a tiny piece of the complete explosion of this derivative bubble that was sitting on top of housing and other things. Housing was just one aspect of it. So it's the derivative bubble that caused this total economic collapse. China will survive their housing bubble because there's no derivatives. If, somebody's, if somebody can't pay their rent, they lose their apartment and they can rent it to somebody else. And there's no bank out there that loses anything except the immediate payments of that person. So this is not a threat to the banking system. So anybody who's saying that the housing bubble in China is going to you know, bring the country down is, just, is, is lying, wants you to think that China is about to go under, and it's not. Although, if this thing is not resolved in the West, then China will not be able to sustain itself by itself. That's true. I mean, it'll do its best. It'll muddle through, you know. But uh, the problem is that it's also probably going to end up in a war, because that's the policy coming from the West, this confrontation of Russia and China. But I think this this development in China is expressive of the fact that Confucianism is, in fact, alive and well. So they didn't open up the way China, the way Russia did. They didn't just, you know, do away with any kind of government. But, but, is, it, but is it, I think it's also fair to take our, our role as an organization into that. Because it's not just that the Chinese decided not to go the way of Russia. There was a huge fight. 
but we were also very much in that fight. I mean, and Helga had fights with people who were telling her, you know, how everything was great. And she was warning them, no, this is coming down. And like one year before the whole 2007, uh, uh, 1997 crisis, you know, there was these big discussions. And then when the Asian tigers were turned into pussies or whatever, you know, <laughs> pussycats, then that was also, I think, you might say more a confirmation for a lot of circles in China that La Rouge was right. And therefore, the lesson to be learned was you cannot follow, I mean, in, in a certain sense, the same as, as, as Clinton said at this time, you know, that La Rouge was right. And therefore, we should discuss a, uh, uh, what did you say, the, the, the Council of foreign, foreign Relations, a new financial architecture. So this also, I think, is, is, is no, should, should be, you, you might say more, but it's to write us, to not to include us in the picture somehow. Uh, no, you're right, absolutely. One of the things that I went through in the speech at, at Frankfurt was just a year before that 97, 98 so-called Asian crisis, which was not really an Asian crisis. It was the first breaking of the global financial bubble, the derivative bubble, because a lot of that deriv a lot of the speculative money from the 90s was pouring into the third world countries, creating a, 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 a bubble there. And basically George Soros pulled the plug in the bubble because he had more money than these countries did. But just a year before that was the year that Helga and the Schiller Institute co-sponsored with the Chinese government and others this huge conference in Beijing on the land bridge, on the new, I forget the long title they had for it, it basically said on the uh, development of the Eurasian land bridge development corridor concept. And Helga was there, she gave a keynote address, she had exactly the kind of fights that, uh, that Tom said and it's like what I discussed the other night at our meeting. How did Tom know there was going to be a collapse here? It wasn't just based because Lynn said so, or speculating, or, or predicting. It was a forecast based on understanding universal history from the top down, seeing that progress is based upon the idea of, of expanding energy flux density. And when you start allowing the energy flux density of an economy to contract, you are creating a situation which unavoidably will explode. And Tom was right then, Helga was right then, Lynn has always been right since 1956, <laughs> you know, because he's looking at it that way. He's not predicting the way all other economists, with only a few exceptions, predict, which is linear extension of current economic processes. Uh, based on some algebraic formulas. Lynn forecasts on the basis of reading the development of humanity as a whole, measured in things like relative population density, energy flux density. So, you know, when you look at a situation like you have today with the complete destruction of nuclear power, the introduction of absolutely primitive kinds of energy generation like windmills and solar panels and so forth, and, you know, it's just unavoidably true to anybody who is thinking that way, i.e. thinking in the context of what uh, Leibniz and the Confucians understood, then they know that these explosions are about to take place. So Helga, yeah, I mean she had lots of these fights and when the 97 bubble burst they were all saying, how'd you know, how'd you know? <laughs> Just like a lot of Danes are saying at the time, how'd you know, how'd you know? Well, think Think like a, you know, think like a Renaissance man, and you'll know too. But you have to, you have to do that study. I mean, you have to commit yourself to these principles, and they're principles that are common to mankind throughout the world. They're there in China, they're there in the West, uh, if we choose to, to use them. A question regarding what you said about this uh, building the waterworks from uh, south or southeast or whether up to north. Uh, in China, I just saw a program about it, how they are demonstrating against this in India and countries in the south, 
they are building a lot of dams and some unofficial projects where they actually are building some kind of tunnel to the east, uh, east of China um, from Tibet. So my question Building a is, tunnel from uh, Tibet? Or unofficially, some, so, so, so oh, oh, they are the water uh, from the parts in Tibet where there are a lot of water uh, supplies uh, to the eastern part where there are a lot of uh, desert, how do you call it, dry. Yeah, um, yeah. So these kind of activities, the south from China, they are not happy about it because that would mean a lot of drought for them. Uh, India, for example, who are depending on the water supplies. That's I saw a program about them. Just asking, how is that in your view? Like showing it would be a very positive thing to do for the development uh, of uh, mankind. Well, uh, there's there's two issues involved. The thing I said in China is moving water from the south to the north. That's different from the issue of the Tibet water, um, because that's simply moving water that at this point is spilling into the ocean and diverting it to the north, which is extremely dry. Beijing for drinking water as well as for agriculture in the north. They have to move some of this water surplus from the south of China, which otherwise drains into the sea, to the north. That's the great infrastructure project. There is some project of diverting some of the headwaters. Tibet is the source of the uh, Ganges Brahmaputra. It's the source of the Mekong. It's the source of the Yangtze in China. I mean, those mountains are very, very big and have a lot of snow. <laughs> so that snow melt generates almost every major water system in all of Asia. So uh, it may be that they're talking about moving some of the water that goes into India the other direction. That would certainly be a problem. I, I, I didn't know that. I'm I hadn't heard they're it. They're building a lot of dams and unofficially and officially. And oh. on, on top of that, they are probably going to implement this uh, project. From dams, dams, are, the, dams are another issue. Um, you know, there's a thing called the International Rivers Project, which is an offshoot of Prince Philip's World Wildlife Fund and the so-called Indigenous Peoples you know, something indigenous people. These are the genocide bodies set up by Prince Philip and the Queen who believe and write about all the time that the only problem facing the human race is that there's too many people and we have to reduce the world's population down to the carrying capacity of the earth, which is about one billion. Now that means eliminating six billion people, but you know, we can deal with that. <laughs> um, it's been done before. <laughs> it's, but not very effectively, Bertrand Russell said. War has proven to be not very effective in this means, said Bertrand Russell. He said, perhaps we should have the bubonic plague spread through the earth every once in a while to hull, cull the herd. It might be uncomfortable, but what of it? That was, that was Bertrand Russell. <laughs> but the International Rivers goes around the world absolutely insisting that every dam is an attack on the ecology, and dams are bad. In fact, they're trying to re remove dams, even in the United States. They're trying to undo the work that the Army Corps of Engineers did in the Missouri. The Hoover uh, Dam? No, well, I don't think that anybody tried to take the Hoover Dam down. <laughs> it'll Not be yet. on this. It'll come. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it'll come to but uh, they, in particular, have really, uh, in a rage, tried to stop the first big dam on the Mekong in Laos, the Shiaburi Dam, which just last month, Laos finally, after years of battling this British oligarchical lie, the, the British had succeeded in getting the downstream countries, Cambodia and, and Vietnam, to officially protest the building of this dam in Laos, which will, will eliminate hundreds of thousands of deaths by controlling the floods, provide huge amounts of electricity to a country which is one of the poorest in the world, and sell some to Thailand, which needs it, uh, and uh, generally control water for agriculture in the, in the plain of jars in Laos, which has tremendous agricultural potential. But this is going to destroy the fish downstream and the poor fishermen are never going to live again because this dam is going to destroy the river and blah, blah, blah. And they succeeded in getting them to stop it for about a year. Well, they finally, with the Chinese and Thai help, were able to convince Cambodia and Vietnam that they'll, they'll do a few things to make sure the fish get through in, you know, in proper kinds of you know how you do this with these steps that you do for the fish to get around and stuff. Um, but they convinced them that this was bunk. And last month they, they basically said, you're right, we're all for it. 
and they announce they're going to go ahead. This is a tremendous victory against the British. I mean, they have spent millions and millions of dollars trying to organize the world against this dam. Same thing in Myanmar, similar things in, in other places. I'm not familiar with exactly which dam that might be. You got to go? See you. Yeah, I'm tired. Yeah, okay. It's the age. So. <laughs> well, Maybe it's you, 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 know a good, you know a lot of the 5,000 year history of China, so age yeah. is worth something, right? <laughs> no, actually, there was at one point a discussion here in Denmark, a Danish professor, that in, this, in the discussion of this whole question of Tibet, which comes up regularly here, of course, and basically saying exactly what you said, he said, I think it was six or eight of all of these major water systems, all coming from Tibet. And exactly for this reason, this is so extremely, extremely important. Because with the development, the, the, I mean, and they, they've just started, so to speak, but the development of this control over all of this water is extremely important not only for China, but for everybody. And that also, I think, gives you the, the, the other side of the coin. Why is it that there's been this insistence that China should not be allowed to develop Tibet? Because that's what the Dalai Lama thing has been all about all along. It is, what is the crime of China that is the... <laughs> that is bringing in development, that is bringing in the control of this water, which really is the key to, to unlocking or, or, or to the development not only of China but all of I don't, I, Eurasia. I, this. I mean, I, in general, water is that, but I, I think the control of Tibet probably doesn't have that much to do because you're not going to do much diversion of water in Tibet. You've got plenty of water. You know. No, 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 no. It's so it's, it's the if they, works. It's the whole thing. Yeah, control. Yeah. yeah, I think I think the problem in Tibet is is not so much just control of water, though. I think it's that you were dealing with. You know what most people don't know is that you were dealing with one of the most degenerate, backward cultures in the history of humanity. At the time, the Chinese just put their foot down and moved in. You had life expectancy of about 35. You had virtually every young man in that society, and this is written up in books by Tibetans, you know. Just about every single young person, young boy, had to go through being a monk's apprentice, which means you're a homosexual slave to the monks. Because it's the sex act which is the religious experience to these tantric Buddhists. It was just mass perversion, which anybody who wants to read about it can just, you know, read about it. It's there. There are many books written by sane people who know Tibet, scholars. There's one very good scholar at Western Reserve University in, in Cleveland who's written about this extensively. Uh, I forget his name now. But, um, you know, that's, that's what you were saying. You know, what the Chinese said was, we can't tolerate this. This is part of our, our nation, and we'll allow a certain amount of autonomy, but we can't allow this kind of perversion. And they know the history of this. They know how the British and the Nazis loved Tibet because this was, you know, Valhalla. This was the source of the Aryan race <laughs> and, you know, cult backwardness and, and so forth. So this was the, the glorious, pure race of, of Tibet. There are problems in Tibet in that there's a lot of Han Chinese moving in, and the Chinese have to be very, very careful not to allow the Han to run everything. And they have to... It's very difficult because you have the Dalai Lama counter-organizing this with everything he can. You know, they're doing this hideous stuff in China proper where there's a lot of Tibetans in China proper who have been uh, self-emulation in dozens and dozens over this last year. I mean, this, this is really sick, crazy stuff. Uh, and the Chinese are a little bit, they're not sure what to do about this. It's a big problem. And the Dalai Lama is, I, I watched a video of, uh, not the Dalai Lama himself, but one of, the, one of his acolytes leading a rally in, in, uh, in uh, I think it was in Xinjiang, where one of the Tibetan areas, where they have the pictures of the people who burn themselves to death, they're rallying the people to get all excited. You have to leave. See ya. Yeah, good. Okay, see ya.
but um, it's really sick. They're rallying people to kill themselves, to emulate, you know, making them heroes, burn themselves to death. Oof. I mean, that's a continuing serious, serious problem. Uh, is the Shanghai Cooperation Organization like being used as to flank these kinds of, uh, you know, divisions between the big nations in, in Asia, and how is that going, working as it is? I mean, at well, yeah, I think so. I think what happened at this last ASEAN conference where Obama went in there with, you know, the push to isolate China around the South China Sea and the push to isolate China with this so-called TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is a free trade agreement amongst those countries that were anti-China. So it's an anti-China move. And everybody gave lip service to this TPP, but as soon as Obama left, they had a meeting of all the Asian countries, except Russia. No, I think with Russia, I forget. Yeah, I think it's with Russia, but also with Australia and New Zealand, for a economic cooperation development organization or something, which is not without the U.S., and which is not free trade, but fair trade. Let's, you know, in other words, a direct counter to this TPP anti-China hysteria. And everybody agreed to it except the U.S., of course. You know, so. Is this water? Yes. We're down to the last few. We can probably stop the formal session here and continue talking. But that's all right. Do you want to stop, or should we just keep chatting while we're here? Uh, if there's more to say, we can just keep doing it on film if you want, unless you want it. Well, I didn't get my question. Oh well, then get it in. It, it was just that, that we were speaking about this, and if you can hold this up for a minute. We were speaking about this uh, the other day, because you, you were speaking before. Where's the, fil where's the film? Yeah, oh. no, no, it's fine. No, oh, just, just. Oh, yeah. I, I'm watching it there. Oh, oh I see what you mean. <laughs> this, this, this is from Leibniz. This is, this is from. Oh, you're moving the camera. Delayed. No, 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 it's delayed. Huh? It takes, it's, it's a couple delayed. of seconds after. It's oh, 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 yeah, you're right. <laughs> okay, okay. This is a, from a poster about Leibniz, and you can see his binary number system with just the ones and the zeros. And when he found out that in China there's something called the I Ching, and it's, it's a, uh, it's something where you have six rows, and each row either has a long line or two short lines. And then there's different combination of these rows with long lines or short lines. But there's only two kinds. There's either long line or short line. And, he, he, and this was developed way back. And he said when he found this out, that they had basically uh, discovered this binary number system back a long time ago. He also said exactly what you were saying uh, before when you were discussing about uh, uh, Socrates and Plato on the one side and uh, Confucius on the other side. That there, uh, I don't, I may not remember the total conclusion, but it was based on something like this is the proof that the that there's not superior races and and inferior, but that all people have this uh, this innate ability to think creatively and to discover the laws of nature. And there, there, this, this was a, a big revelation to him when he found this out, that, that then you could equate these uh, great cultures. Jushi wrote about the I Ching, too. Um, and he and his associates, the, the Cheng Yi and Cheng Zai, these guys, recognize the value of the I Ching, the Book of Changes. But the problem is that it, it, it's full of, of, um, of forecasts of certain kinds or predictions. And it had become the basis of uh, necromnancy, of uh, fortune telling. And uh, the, the, these four, four digit numbers, this 
number system, or threes, six actually, six, six three and three. These digits, which represented uh, a binary number system, were being used as sort of like fortune-telling cards or something. Uh, so they recognized the, the importance and the value of the I Ching, but they had to constantly polemicize against this, these forecasts as if they were fortune-telling. But always saying, in fact, there's an example in one of the articles, my articles that I read today, I didn't mark it, but it was something like saying, for instance, uh, one of these statements, if you throw the sticks and you get 110011 and you look up that thing in the I Ching and it says uh, you're going to have good fortune, you have to ask yourself, are you living according to Ren? then maybe it will be true. <laughs> that you, in other words, it's not magic, it's not fortune-telling. So uh, it's an interesting thing. I've never studied it intensely, but I know that unfortunately the I Ching is very popular amongst the kind of cults today, you know, because of the fortune-telling aspect and the magic of it. But, uh, but it is used extensively by them for the content, which, again, I can't say too much about because I haven't studied that. But certainly the, the binary number system idea was something that really impressed Leibniz. Which who, he, well, dis, who discovered it? Who discovered the binary oh, system in the know. West and then discovered that it had already existed in a certain form, not as comprehensive as his, but it existed in ancient China. Because this the I Ching comes from something like 5000 BC. I mean, real old. You know, something at least 2000 BC. Yeah, something like 2000 BC. I'm very, very old. Uh, yes. um, could I ask you to read the quote again by this uh, Renaissance uh, leader, Xi Shu? Zhu Xi? Uh, I think it was him about householding. It started out with, about what? It started out with householding. How oh, oh, the. Um, <laughs> I know what you mean. The one that ends up with. To know knowledge is to investigate the nature of things, the principle in things. Yeah, maybe yeah I read through it very quickly. It's, um, yeah, here it is, right here. All right, this, this is a very, very famous passage from the, from the Dasha, um, which he added that last sentence to. Those of antiquity who wished that all men throughout the emperor, the empire keep their inborn luminous virtue unobscured, that's that phrase that uh, he had added as the interpretation of that concept. First, put, their go put governing their states well first. The first thing is you have to have a well-governed state according to the principles of uh, inborn luminous virtue. Wishing to govern their states well, they first established harmony in their households. In other words, it's your family relations. Having a stable family caring for your children, and so forth. That's first. Wishing to establish harmony in their households, they first cultivated themselves. <laughs> Take care of yourself first, then you can deal with your wife and kids. Wishing to cultivate themselves, they first set their minds on the right, on the good. Wishing to set their minds on the right, they first made their thoughts true. And that, of course, has implications, which I won't go into. Wishing to make their thoughts true, in other words, not just opinion. You can't just put your, you can't just do good by having good opinions. You have to make your thoughts truthful. It has to be coherent with the real laws of the universe. Wishing to make their thoughts true, they first extended their knowledge to the utmost, to the utmost. Then, Jushi added, the extension of knowledge lies in fully apprehending the principle in things. Not just knowing a lot of things, but knowing the principles that govern things. What's behind the shadows, as Plato called them. What's behind the shadows? What's the actual lawfulness of those things that we see and sense? That's it. And where did the rest come from? This is from the Dasha. This is one of the great books, the great by, learning. By Confucius. No? Yes, some of it's by Confucius. Uh, some of it was from antiquity. And it was actually Zhu Xi who put together what's called the four books, which is the Confucian dialects, the Mencian dialects, the Dasha, this thing, and the I Ching. 
and it's studying the four books is the sort of basis of the, the examination system and education generally and qualifications for government. Yes? You've been behind the screen the whole time. Natasha. Uh, if uh, today or for the past 10, 15 years, if you visit uh, China and if you read um, different kind of uh, works uh, within different humanitarian, uh, not humanitarian, it's called humanistic disciplines, like philosophy, social theory, whatever, uh, produced by Chinese intellectuals and scholars, how much uh, Confu Confucianism can, <coughs> or the spirit of the Confucianism, Confucianism can you still uh, sense or recognize in uh, the intellectual life? Current, current. Current, yeah. I'm not, I'm not on top of this completely because I haven't been able to do the kinds of in-depth research that I did when I was in prison and I got out in 2000, so I've, I haven't followed it completely. But I did spend some time in, at Harvard and in some of the Washington University environments of Chinese. There's a guy named um, Du Wei Ming. You might have come across his name. He's, you heard that name? No, no, no. Du Wei Ming, uh, who is sort of the most championed scholar of the Confucian Renaissance. In other words, he has been put forward pretty much by the West more so than by China, but also by some in China as the spokesman for the attempt to revive Confucianism. He was hired by um, um, uh, uh, the Singapore, um, ay, 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 the guy that ran Singapore for many years, the guy that was called the best bloody Englishman in the uh, east of the Suez. Um, uh, no, no, the head of Singapore. Um, Lee, Lee Tung Wei. No, 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 no. Lee Tung Wei was the guy in Taiwan. Oh, oh my God, I'm forgetting. Anyway, the, the British puppet dictator or president of, of Singapore. Anyway, he hired this guy, Du Ming, to come down to help set up some Confucian education in their school system in Singapore. And he's wined and dined at Harvard and stuff like that. So I, I went to a couple of their conferences. I went out to dinner with them. I had a chance to talk with them a bit, and then I read a lot of his stuff. And it's what I was mentioning before. He's a promoter of Wang Yang Ming, this guy who was the Aristotelian counter to Zhu Xi, a couple centuries, 150 years later. And Wang Yang Ming was also admired by Chiang Kai-shek. And Chiang Kai-shek was a very decent guy and his children unlike what you might read about being a bloody dictator and stuff. Um, he developed Taiwan using American system type methods, but not just because he was getting help from America. In fact, it was because he really organized the country along Confucian lines. But philosophically, he was an advocate of Wang Yang Ming because it's practical. The Wang Yang Ming Aristotelian view is viewed as being practical. And it's like what we said before about the two roads that could be taken in China after the opening up. One was practical, let's let the big money come in and that'll help us out and then we can use the money to do something good in the future. That was the argument I used to get from these guys. It's practical. And they tend to be followers of this Wang Yang Ming school. And if you try to get people to think more philosophically about what's needed in the long term for the economy or what's good for the population, uh, and, and advocate Zhu Xi as opposed to Wang Yang Ming, they'll say that's just not practical. We need, you know, we need to open up quick and get the money and this kind of thing. So this, that fight is going on now. Um, on the other hand, as I said, although I don't know too much about it, there are some people who have begun to, to publish books about this Zhu Xi versus Wang Yang Ming conflict, who are identifying the fact that pragmatism and practicality is not what's needed when we're in a crisis in the world. We need a renaissance. We need a transformation, a paradigm shift. We need true creativity, not just practical deals with a collapsing world economy. Uh, so partially that's because China is beginning to pay the consequences, as you pointed out, uh, of having allowed the setup of these pretty much uh, cheap labor export zones, which made a lot of money, 
and help them in that sense, but which now is proving to be a real problem in that both they're shutting down because the West is collapsing and pulling stuff out and because they've become dependent on exports into these European and, and American economies rather than building up the domestic demand through you know, vast infrastructure projects and so forth. So they're trying to do that. They have been now for about 10 years. They've been trying to emphasize, you know, let's get away from the cheap labor in the coast. Let's build up the economy. Let's industrialize the heartland. Let's move water to the north. And in industrializing the west, they're also fighting to get the land bridge, the central route of the land bridge that goes through Xinjiang and Kazakhstan and then into Europe and down into the Middle East. They want to really upgrade that mid the middle route of the land bridge so they can take the industrial output from the far west of China directly off into Asia. And this all has philosophical consequences, you know, in the, in the philosophical arguments it's, it's Zhu Xi versus Wang Yang Ming or Confucianism versus Taoism, something like that. So it's sort of like short-term, long-term... Uh, exactly. Uh, it's the long, long wave of history or immediate practicality and so forth. How do they get people in the United States to go along with this crap that's going on? It's because, well, we have to do it now because next week we have to be able to cut the budget, you know. <laughs> so we have to slit our throats in order to meet the budget demands for next week. Let's vote on how to best kill our constituents. I mean, it's, it's insane stuff, but it's because they're getting trapped into this idea of being practical. Don't challenge the system. You can't change the system. We have to make do with what we've got. Well, what we've got is death, is collapse. You know? So we have to challenge the system, and we can. We know how to do it. It's been done before. We have the examples in China, in Asia, as well as in the United States, but especially in the United States. And we do need to convey that idea, as Tom was pointing out, you know, we do have to take responsibility for getting these ideas out in Asia and Africa and so forth, which we do to the best of our ability. Um, but these ideas have potency because they prove to be true. As, as he was saying about the 97 collapse, or as, as, as we learned here when Tom predicted the economic crisis in his campaign, just before it happened, you know. You got it? <laughs>